Optimism is a good characteristic, but if carried to excess, it becomes foolishness. We are prone to speak of the resources of this country as inexhaustible. This is not so. Theodore Roosevelt. All right, so one of the things that I want to talk about here is the concept of a feedback loop. And I saw from uh, some of the activities that we've already been doing, uh, from some of the ed puzzles, those kind of things, that these can be really tricky to understand. And it, it's been my experience that feedback loops can sometimes be a little difficult. So I want to make sure that I go over this and make sure that we have a clear understanding of what a feedback loop is and also how to tell the difference between a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop, okay? So there are two main types, but what you need to keep in mind, and this is what trips people up sometimes, is when we say it's a positive feedback loop, that doesn't mean that it's good, all right? If we say a negative feedback loop, it doesn't mean that it's bad, and vice versa. If we say positive feedback loop, that doesn't mean it's always bad either. It's not about good or bad or things like that. These are just two ways in which change in a system is expressed. Okay? So instead, what I want you to do is think of positive and negative in terms of addition or subtracting, adding to a change, or reducing the total change. Okay? So that's really what we're talking about when we say it's a positive feedback loop or a negative feedback loop. The first one I want to look at is a positive feedback loop. And again, 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 and I will keep saying this over and over, it does not mean good or bad, just that there is more change, okay? So a positive feedback loop is one where as the loop continues, there is going to be an addition or an additive level of change, all right? So the example that I like on this one is how fruit ripens, all right? So part of what causes fruit to ripen is exposure to a chemical called ethylene, all right? It's something that a fruit will produce naturally, but when exposed to ethylene, fruits will ripen. So this creates a positive feedback loop. So if you've ever had like a bunch of bananas or um, an apple, or maybe you've heard the expression, one bad apple can spoil the bunch. Well, this is actually where it comes from because the plant has a mechanism so that when one fruit starts to ripen, it will make sure that all of the other fruits are, fruits are ripe as well. And this ensures that they're all on the same cycle and they are all attracting some animal that's gonna eat them, carry the seeds somewhere else and pass those seeds and spread the, the fruit wherever, because that's really what fruit's for. All right, so you start with a ripening fruit and it releases ethylene. That ethylene goes out into a system and it causes other fruit to ripen. It ripens the other fruit maybe on that same tree or same plant or even other plants around it. This causes then more fruit to ripen and release ethylene, which then causes further nearby fruits ripening. And pretty soon you've got a whole forest of trees that are all ripe at the same time. So this just makes sure that all of that's going on at the same time and increases the chances of this species of plant seeds being dispersed, all right? So this is something that is a positive feedback loop because as the fruit ripens, it produces ethylene. As that uh, ethylene interacts with other fruits, they ripen and then release more ethylene. And this can then actually even turn them to overripe, which is what we would call rotten. One bad apple over ripens the whole bunch. There you go. That's where that expression actually comes from. All right. So then let's talk about the opposite. Talk about a negative feedback loop. Okay. So again, doesn't mean bad. It just means a reduction in change. In other words, as the system causes a change away from equilibrium, it will then reverse itself back to equilibrium. And remember, equilibrium is like balance. All right. Everything is even and at a stable state. Okay. So, an example of this one is historic, and when I say historic, I mean geologically historic, the past 35 million years of CO2 levels on our planet. And this is a cycle that takes a long time to go through its paces, all right? So you start off with maybe CO2 levels are rising for some reason, okay? Maybe there's a die-off, maybe there's fewer trees for some reason, and so those CO2 levels start to go up. Then what you get from that is plants now have more CO2 available to them because plants take in carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis, they produce 
oxygen as a byproduct. Okay, now the oxygen levels start to go up. So the CO2 levels go down, the oxygen levels go up. But when the oxygen levels go up, that means there's less available for the trees or plants or whatever. So the trees and plants have less uh, CO2 to work with. The temperature will go down, because remember, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It insulates and keeps the heat in on our planet. So the temperature uh, will go down, all right? And a higher level of oxygen causes big fires. So both of those will adjust the total number of plants. You'll have fewer plants, and that'll cause the CO2 levels to start to rise again. So you can see that this one here looks like a big circle, basically. Yeah, it's a misshapen circle because of how I drew those arrows, but oh well, don't judge me. Um, that's how you have a negative feedback loop. It's a loop that keeps itself in balance. Another example of this one that I see a lot is like your thermostat at home, where as the temperature goes up, the air conditioner comes on and cools your house down. Once it gets below a certain temperature, the air conditioner shuts off, and then the outside air temperature uh, warms up and it brings the air conditioner back on and it just keeps going through that cycle. That's the same idea, all right? All right, so let's uh, let's ask why are these these feedback loops important? So in looking at uh, environmental science, what we can see is that ecosystems and biology and a lot of natural systems are actually controlled by a series of feedback loops. Um, these can include stuff like how ecosystems change and go back to equilibrium, but it also includes things in biology like how uh, bodies maintain a homeostasis. All right, so this can look at how your body controls blood sugar and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, in environmental science in particular, though, we are discovering that a number of environmental problems are actually connected to feedback loops. All right. So one of them is uh, ocean acidification. All right. So ocean acidification has some interesting feedback loops actually attached to it. In one way, as the ocean becomes more acid like, has a higher pH. All right. This is happening because. Um, you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all right? Um, but when that pH goes up, it starts to dissolve the calcium carbonate in the um, limestone, in sands, in deposits that have washed into the ocean, and also in marine animals. So marine animals oftentimes have exoskeletons or shells, like clams have shells and oysters have shells and stuff like that, and coral. I mean, it's got a calcium carbonate exoskeleton as well those are actually dissolved by the acidification of the ocean um, so as that's dissolved that goes into the water it neutralizes the acid and it actually brings it back to equilibrium okay so erosion of calcium carbonate deposits especially in things like limestone which is all calcium carbonate it's a geologic formation that will actually bring it back to equilibrium and keep the ocean at kind of a buffered solution. The problem is, though, that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually means that more carbon dioxide is going to then be absorbed by the ocean. Okay, so as the carbon dioxide concentration goes up, the ocean gets better at absorbing it. Also, the warmer it is, the more carbon dioxide can be technically absorbed by the ocean in some ways um, and then it speeds up the reaction where it then tries to neutralize things so you actually have two different feedback loops competing here the atmosphere is being adjusted by the ocean but the ocean is becoming more acidic and that's killing off animals uh, eutrophication eutrophication is the process by which the water becomes cloudy or turbid or basically you can't see through it as a result of uh, an overabundance of organisms uh, that are photosynthetic, so single-celled uh, plants, essentially. All right, they're not really plants, they're protists, but we'll not split those hairs right now. Um, this is another feedback loop, because as they choke out a lot of the life on the bottom, it causes this loop, feedback loop of increasing disturbance as the oxygen levels go down, causes more bacteria to bloom. Um, then as those single celled organisms die off, they create more, bac uh, more bacteria bloom in order to break them down. And it just causes these huge dead zones. Uh, atmospheric carbon levels, I mentioned this already, but this gets even more insidious because as the temperature goes up from higher atmospheric carbon levels, 
What this also causes is an increase in breakdown in things that are normally um, anaerobic, meaning that they don't use oxygen to break down. It speeds up aerobic breakdown, releases more carbon into the atmosphere. Also, this is thawing certain parts of the land which have permafrost, which have stopped things from breaking down or decaying for sometimes thousands of years. And now all of a sudden that stuff's breaking down and releasing carbon and methane into the atmosphere. Um, so that's another feedback loop that as carbon levels rise, more natural sources of carbon are being emitted. So that's speeding up this process as well. Um, desertification, this is the process by which uh, biomes become deserts, they dry out. So when you start removing trees and plants from an area, that area starts to get hotter and drier. And then as it becomes more dry, a bigger desert will form and it will just get bigger and bigger and bigger and it will spread and this becomes a big problem. In Africa, you've got the Sahara Desert, it's actually growing and spreading. When humans first arrived on the scene about 12,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert wasn't as much of a desert as it is now. It's actually a very small area. There was water throughout that whole region, but it has dried up as a result of this desertification process. Now that's being hastened along by continuing shifts in the climate. Um, and then lastly, something called a trophic cascade, and we're going to cover that in very short order. But what that is, is when you remove certain species from the ecosystem, the whole food web, the whole interconnected nature of this animal eats that one and that animal eats the other one, and then it builds and builds and builds, can break down. And as it starts to break down, it speeds up the breakdown. All right, because when you take out one piece of that little Jenga tower that is your uh, in your e environment and your ecosystem, it can bring the whole thing down depending on where that's placed. So each part of an ecosystem has this ability to help balance the rest of it. It's like this big interconnected web, or like I said, a tower, a Jenga tower, or whatever. However you need to wrap your head around that is fine, but what you need to understand is that because of this interconnected nature, that's why when you lose one part of an ecosystem, it can actually destabilize that ecosystem and make it go bad even faster, all right? It's a feedback loop, all righty. Okay, but how do we study these connections? And this is where it gets a little tricky, okay? There's a bunch of different ways that scientists can study ecosystem connections. You can look at an ecosystem that's already changed, um, you can definitely go out there and you can observe the ecosystems and if you get to know what that ecosystem is supposed to look like, you can spot when the problem happens. But a lot of it has to deal with sampling techniques because you can't be watching every part of an ecosystem constantly all the time. So a big part of that is something called sampling. Uh, sampling is where you study a part of the ecosystem all right, and you see what it's doing and then you study another part and you get an idea of how these different parts are working and by looking at parts of it you can get an idea of the whole all right so here's a practical thought experiment on how you could do this imagine a huge forest that spans hundreds of miles you could not be reasonably expected to go out and count every forest or, or every tree in that forest all right you, you could not be expected to count every tree on the planet but if you look at an individual forest you could probably count how many trees there are in say 100 square meters. You could probably even do this a bunch of times to get an average. So let's say you find a forest that spans, you know, 500 square miles, right? Or 500 square kilometers, if we're staying with that. You could go out, you could sample a 100 square meter area that's imagine the length of a football field by another football field that's the same length. So it's basically two football fields together. Um, I, this is not something maybe you could do in one day. It might take you a couple days to do it. Um, you could count how many trees there are and how many of each type. You could then go to another area and do it again and again and again and again until you have an average. All right. So on average, you have X number of trees per 100 square meters. Now you take pictures of the forest all right you could do this with a drone flying overhead or better yet use a satellite image we've got satellite mapping of most of the planet at this point and we use that for like google maps and navigation and those kind of things but you could do that and then trace out the area of that and calculate how many miles this forest covers 
at that point you can now get a rough idea of how many trees so all you have to do is multiply the average number of trees per 100 square meters by total area of the forest in square meters and there you have it you have a rough estimate of approximately how many trees there are in that forest now is this going to be exact down to the single tree no but this is going to give you an idea and when you're dealing with literally millions of trees if you're accurate to a hundred or even a thousand trees you're within an acceptable margin of error and then you've got an idea of how healthy that forest is because in turns out in forests there is a problem of having not enough trees but also having too many trees because if your forest is too dense that means that a fire can spread really quickly but that comes to our second part constructing a model okay so it would be impractical unethical and dangerous to test things directly on nature all right so what that means is if you're wondering okay well let me think here how many trees are too many trees how close together do the trees have to be in order for a forest fire to spread out of control before we have a chance to fix it should you go out to the forest and just start lighting fires to see how quickly it spreads that's a bad idea that's not a good idea don't do that that don't that's how major forest fires start and we lose the whole forest all right but instead okay how about we get a model of this we build a model on a table of trees that are distances different distances apart and we light them on fire all right hell make them out of toilet paper tubes or whatever and we see how far that fire can jump and see if it scales up to different sizes or or in a larger context what if you had uh, let's say a field where you were going to plant something all right maybe put some trees out ahead of time that are grown on farms or whatever or better yet why don't we collect all the old christmas trees that are left over after the end of the christmas season put them out in a field at different distances apart and see how quickly a fire can spread because they're dry they're dead they're gonna be broken down anyway and you know what if we burn them like that just convert them to ash well yeah it releases some co2 into the atmosphere but that ash can actually be really really good for the soil slash and burn technique is a technique that's been used to enrich farming for hundreds of years okay so we're making a model we're figuring this out from that now we could use that and apply that to looking at our actual forest all right um so this is something that scientists do they will sometimes also construct uh, do tests on plants or parts of plants or organisms or parts of organisms in a laboratory setting in order to do that so this is laboratory science so in ecology and environmental science we study things both out in the wild and also in forests and you can actually see here that i've got a picture of what looks like a giant model of some sort of river system or something that's actually from the louisiana um, state university uh, department of uh, sciences where they're studying the path of the mississippi river through louisiana and they're using this to try and figure out where floods are going to happen all right and this lets us all work on things like that to create connections between research of different things in order to better understand our whole world all right so we can understand the chemistry we can understand the biology we can understand the ecology the interactions between all of these different independent looking things all of it coming together all right and that's what environmental science is all about all right it's about looking at these loops and creating connections between them so this is how environmental science uh, does its experimentation all right so last thing let's review real quick okay so feedback loops connect biotic and abiotic factors and what biotic and abiotic factors mean is biotic is living or once living things and abiotic are chemicals and uh, non-living things so like water and rocks and um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so feedback loops connect the two all right they influence each other positive feedback loops are going to have a continually increasing rate of change whereas negative feedback loops are self-correcting and bring things back to equilibrium back to an even state that's the idea there scientists study ecosystems by observing these connections and ecosystems are studied both in person by going out into the field and looking around and looking at trees and rocks and plants and animals and all that fun stuff 
but also by sampling, looking at a part of it and understanding the whole from that and using that to get an understanding of the whole, I should say. Uh, models, so constructing models in labs and controlled conditions, and then also laboratory experimentation by seeing if it is possible to reverse some of these things, doing chemical analysis, um, and by literally creating new systems to see how they behave. All right, so uh, that's what I wanted to cover at this time. Um, that's going to kind of wrap up the first little part of uh, environmental science and looking at how um, the science of environmental science kind of functions. Now what we need to start looking into is the stuff on these things. So we need to actually start looking at some of these cycling methods, looking at how some of these um, elements interplay in nature. So the next step is going to be looking at how um, all of this stuff is actually recycled on Earth because we know Earth is a closed system. We're not getting any more matter. So how does the Earth recycle matter? And that's what's coming up next. All right, guys. Uh, I want you to take care. Have a great day. And I'll see you soon. Bye.